Today's episode is called Damaged Goods. And if you're not a fan of that phrase, you are not alone because I also do not care for that phrase much at all. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. In fact, this is what the phrase means. It is a person who is considered to be no longer desirable or valuable because of something that has happened, a person whose reputation is damaged. Now, whether or not you've had your reputation damaged, I think more of us than I would like to think fall into the category of no longer feeling desirable or valuable because of something that has happened. It may be a flippant comment that somebody made. It could be somebody refusing to let you do something, a door shutting in your face. It could be losing a job. It could be losing your health. It could be losing a relationship that was really important to you. So many things. And I was thinking about this. I've been thinking about this nonstop for several days now because I was at a gathering lately where someone brought up the Samaritan woman at the well. And they didn't bring her up once. They brought her up twice in a conversation that was lasting for quite a while, a couple of hours. And twice they brought up the woman at the well. And both times that they brought her up, the descriptions that they used for her were definitely not pleasing. They were, uh, one is a word that I don't think I can say, and I won't. It's a synonym for a prostitute. And the other word was an adulterer. And I came home and I dug through my Bible a little bit. And then I got out several commentaries because I wanted to know, can we call her an adulterer? What do we know about this woman? Do we know that she was a prostitute? Do we know that she was an adulterer? What do we know? And several commentators said basically the same thing. We can't entirely be sure how she got in and out of her marriages. We just don't know. Did her husbands leave her? Did she leave her husbands? But apparently the laws in Samaria at the time regarding marriage may have been fairly easy to get in and out of a marriage. So it could have been her. She could have been the one walking away. We don't know. Living with somebody outside of a marriage makes her technically an adulterer living with somebody who may or may not have been married before. She may or may not have been married before. I think the better, more accurate word may be fornicator, someone who is having sex outside of marriage. I don't know technically if she could be called an adulterer, as in she left her marriage to have and pursue a sexual relationship with someone else. I don't know that. I do know that this is a woman who was loved by God and who was far from worthless. No matter what anybody else in the town may have thought, the women, the other women, the gossips, the other men, I don't don't know what they thought. This is what I do know. I know that Jesus had to go through Samaria to get to Galilee, not because it was the only way to get there. I know that he had to go through Samaria because he had a divine appointment with a woman who had five husbands and was living with someone who was not her husband. And I know that when Jesus talked to this woman, she not only was receptive to what he had to say, she not only acknowledged that he was a prophet, but she ran to tell everyone in her town And they came and asked Jesus to stay with them. So whatever labels she may have had, and whoever may have thought she was worthless or beyond saving or damaged goods, that is not how God saw her. And it hadn't been long. It was just a few days after having this conversation and hearing 
somebody talk about the Samaritan woman in this context, that I met with a group of women. I was invited to come to their meeting and speak to them. And I barely entered this meeting before I realized the enormous amount of hurt that was in the room. It was just palpable. And I had planned to talk about one thing, but when I got in the room, I said, I don't think I'm going to talk to you tonight about this. I have a feeling there are much bigger things that we need to discuss. And I just let these women tell me about some of the things that were going on in their life. And I don't know how my heart could hurt anymore. And I found myself thinking, these women think they are worthless. They have been beat down by the devil, the world, and their own sinful nature. I cannot sit in this room and not tell them their worth that they have in Christ. If I do nothing else before I leave, I need to let them know that they are daughters of the king and that there is not one thing, there's not a man alive who can strip that title of you. There is not a circumstance that can happen to you. There is not an, an opportunity that where you were overlooked and told you were not good enough. There's not a crime that can be committed against you that makes you feel worthless, but there's not, there's not a single thing in this world that can happen to you that can change the value you have in God's sight. And too many times we all fall into these places of letting the world determine our worth instead of remembering who we are in Christ. And that's why I knew when I left that room, I had to make sure that everyone else understands too that this is non-negotiable. And I know how easy it is for the army of evil to play on me. It doesn't take much at all. I overthink everything and I underestimate my worth and I underestimate what I can accomplish. And I know it's not me. It's not me that can achieve great things, that can do great things. It's always God in me. And yet time after time after time, I find myself saying, Amber, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? You are not good enough to do this. Someone else needs to step in. And then I remember Moses and how he was telling that to God. And God was saying, Moses, who gave you your mouth? And then I remember David, who was a little shrimp of a man. I mean, we don't know that he was a shrimp of a man so much. That's an exaggeration. I'm sorry. But we do know that he tried to try on King Saul's armor and it was way too big for him. We do know that he didn't have a title. He hadn't been anointed yet when he went out to face Goliath. And so it was a somewhat pesky little brother who had been tending his father's sheep, who nobody knew, who seemed small. Goliath called him a boy. And yet that is exactly who God used to slay a, a giant with a pebble, by the way. So when I look through the Bible and see all the people that God used and how good God was to use them, not because they were so valuable on their own, but because God says, hey, look, I need to work through somebody. And for whatever reason, I've chosen you, Moses, and you, David, and I've chosen you, Gideon, and you, Esther. Esther certainly was beautiful. And she ended up being the queen. And yet, when it came time to stand up for her people, she didn't feel like she was up to the challenge. She, she had to break some laws. She had to go stand before this heathen, arrogant, flippant king who could just, in one meeting, 
sign off to have an entire people destroyed. And that's who she was supposed to confront and ask to save her own people. So when I go to the Bible and I say, huh, God used all these people who didn't think that they had much to offer. Maybe he wants to use me and that's okay. So maybe instead of second guessing myself all the time, saying you're not good enough, counting the ums, worrying about this, that, and the other, maybe, just maybe, we should just focus on the work that we have to do in Christ and be strong enough knowing our identity in him that it doesn't matter what other people say, doesn't matter what doors get shut in our face, and it certainly doesn't matter the thoughts that go through our head all day long because we know who we are in Christ and that he is for us. So I'm going to give you three Bible passages to prove this because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to take God's word for it. So starting the first in Lamentations 3, verses 22 to 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. That means completely destroyed. For his compassion, his concern for others, namely us, his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, I don't know about you, but the Lord's great love and his concern for us causes us him to have mercy on us every day. He's not going to destroy us. We deserve being destroyed. I deserve being destroyed. The thoughts that go through my head at times, the words that come out of my mouth at times, the actions that I take that God clearly would not be thrilled with. I sometimes wish that Jesus was just sitting across the table from me and could kind of go, no, don't do that, Amber. Or probably don't don't say that, Amber. Or just, mm. but in the meantime, we're supposed to have some self-control. But even when we don't, the Lord's great love is so so big towards us. His compassion, his concern is so great that every day we start with a clean slate, a a blank page. We see the sunrise and we can say, okay, God, you know what? You've sent my sins yesterday. As far as the East is from the West today, I get to start over. Thank you. Not everybody will give us that chance on earth. Some people are going to hold a grudge. Some people are going to say three strikes, you're out. Some people are going to say, you are no longer welcome in my home, or I don't want you in my life, and that's okay. That's not how God God operates. His love for us is new every day. It doesn't ever run out. Okay, next passage. Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? In other words, who dare tell you that you are worthless in God's eyes? Who dare challenge the concept that God loves you? Who dare? Who dared to make you feel worthless? What kind of trouble? What kind of persecution? What What in the world can separate you from the love of Christ? Then he quotes Psalm 44, verse 22, that says, For your sake we face death all day long. We we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. In other words, the people who are bringing God's word to you, all day long they face this hardship. And they're saying, who can separate you from the love of Christ? And then he says, no you're not going to be separated from the love of Christ. In all these things, all what things? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, whatever you're facing, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Do you you grasp that? You are so loved that you are not defeated and you are not broken. You're more than conquerors. You're victorious. You're completely and totally victorious. For I am convinced that neither life nor death, neither angels or demons, 
neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's not a place that you can go that you are outside of the bounds of God's love. You can't go too high in the kingdom of God. You can't go too low in the kingdom of God. You you can't be disqualified because of your past. Nothing in the present can separate you from the love of Christ and nothing in the future. That means if down the line you can't do anything in the kingdom, if you can no longer see or hear or make sense, it doesn't matter because there is nothing that can separate you from the love that is in Christ Jesus, your Lord. Nothing. You are victorious. You're a conqueror. You are a son or daughter of the king. End of story. Done. Done. (laughs) So next time you have a thought that comes to your mind that says you stink or you're not good enough or you are worthless. The response is not true. I am more than a conqueror. I'm completely victorious. And there is nothing, nothing that I did, have done, will do that can separate me from the love of Christ. End of story. That's taking every thought captive. Done. Ephesians 3, 14 through 24. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his faith, through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to be do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory, in the church, or and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians is that we may know the depth of God's love to grasp beyond any amount of knowledge and filled with the fullness of God That is his prayer for the Ephesians. Not that they would get a good job. Not that they would stay in good health. Not that they would prosper. But that they would know who they are in Christ and how loved they are. And then, because of your identity as a son or daughter of the king, you know that God is willing and able to do immeasurably more than you could ask or imagine. You are a son or daughter of the king. You know what that means? You can walk right into the palace. You can go straight to the throne of God. And you can ask your dad for anything you need. You're an heir. You don't have to wait at the back gate. You don't have to take a number and wait for your turn. You have access to the King of Kings and the Lords of Lords. So we need to start making use of this. So what are our action plans? When we're feeling worthless, what are we going to do? Number one, we're going to pray for strength. Number two, we're going to pray to be reminded of our identity in Christ. Because identity matters. It matters when you know you are a child of the King. You cannot be worthless. Therefore, you are loved. Number three, you're going to pray to be aware of Satan's schemes. The more we're aware of this, the more we can combat it. So 
when those whispers come in, when people do things to us, when people say things about us, people are sinful. And as long as we live in this sinful world, people are going to say things to us. And sometimes I try to remind myself that hurt people hurt people. Should hurt people hurt people? No, I have a whole page about that in You Can Trust God When Life Hurts. It's far better to get your hurt under control so you don't lash out at other people because all you're doing is making pain for somebody else. And and that doesn't help your pain go away. It only puts it on someone else. So that's, that's not a good option. But the point being this, Satan loves to make us ineffective, paralyze us, think that we're worthless and we have no value in God's kingdom. And we've just shown through several passages that that's not the case. So be aware that when you have those thoughts, when someone says something to you or when someone treats you in a way that treats you as someone who's worthless instead of showing you their value, your value, instead of treating you as someone with value, We have to remember who we are and we have to remember that Satan is going to use us to try to make us ineffective and to feel worthless. So pray that you recognize Satan's schemes so that you can war against them. All right. Get together with other Christians who will speak the truth over you. When you are hurt, when you are going through something, it is so easy to lose sight of the truth. And we need people who will speak the truth to us. When you have a loved one who dies, if you have a Christian funeral, a pastor very often, your pastor, if you're a member of a church, comes in and talks to you before the funeral. And he says things that if you've been in the word, you've heard so many times. You know these things. And yet, in that moment, that's exactly what you need to be reminded of. You need to be reminded that Jesus is the resurrection and life and that anyone who believes in him will never die. You need to be reminded of that. Now, you may have heard that every Easter your whole life long. You may have read your Bible cover to cover and you have highlighted it and you know it and you can say it. But in that moment, you need someone speaking truth to you because pain can cloud our vision. And the same is true here. We need people speaking over us. Just yesterday, I was working with a friend who came to help me set this up and get lights together and everything. And we were we were moving the table all around and trying to figure out where to put it and what to do. And he said, Amber, I just, I just don't like the idea of putting you in the corner. And I started laughing and I said, you're not. I'm putting myself in the corner because I like this corner. I like it a lot. But the point is that he is just one of those people who is so respectful and so kind and wants to know that I have worth in the Lord. Okay. Again, be aware of the self-talk. I've already brought this up multiple times, so I'm not going to belabor that. And then the next thing, the last thing, is to take one step in the right direction every day. So I don't know if you've heard, it was um, Navy SEAL William McRaven, who had a speech. It's there's, it's all over. You can Google it. It's a uh, if you want to change the world or if you want to change your life, make your bed. And he was just talking about how the effects of one action can snowball all throughout the day. So you get up and you make your bed and that leads to the next good decision and the next good decision and the next good decision. And even if the whole day has been an absolute mess, at least when you get home to your bed at night, your bed is made. And so you have something to look forward to. At least your bed was made. And the same can be true of us. You know, things tend to snowball and go from bad to worse a lot of times. I just had this happen. I was pretty sick for three weeks. Didn't exercise like I like to. Didn't eat the way I should. I was eating all times of the day and night because I was sick. I just, I had this respiratory thing going on. And so if I woke up in the middle of the night or... If I just felt depleted, I I ate. And finally, after three weeks, I stepped on the scale and it was not fun. And it's very easy in those moments to go, okay, it's gone from 
bad to worse to worse, then I also didn't keep up with my housework because I didn't have the energy. I also didn't get, you know, the projects done that I wanted to get done. I also didn't weed my garden. I also didn't, also didn't, also did. So easy to snowball in the wrong direction. It also is true that one good choice, one good thing can lead to the next good thing. And I would suggest the one good thing you start with not making your bed, although I like to do that too. If you have one good thing that you're going to do, read your Bible. Start your day or on your lunch break, whenever you can get to it, make sure you read your Bible because that's where you're going to be reminded of God's promises, his love. That's where you're going to be reminded of your identity in Christ. Read your Bible, set aside a little time to pray, and then let that decision, that one small choice lead to the next good choice, lead to the next good choice, the next good choice. If you set out to do a hundred things and you're going to change them all at once, there's a good choice chance you're going to fall. You're not going to be able to do all those things. And so you're going to get discouraged and not do them. So just do one or two. This week, I'm going to start by adding in Bible study time. You know, I'm going to read my Bible for 10 minutes a day. Next week, I'm going to read my Bible for 10 minutes a day in the morning. And then I'm going to take on my lunch hour. I'm going to set a five minute timer. I'm just going to talk to God. And I'm going to tell him all the things that are on my heart. I'm going to ask him for his help. And I'm going to ask him that he shows me how much he loves me and how he can work through me. And I'm just going to do those two things. And then next week, I'm going to add something else. I'm going to maybe go for a walk going to maybe make my bed. I'm going to make two good healthy meals this week. I'm going to make sure I get to bed before 10. I'm going to turn off my phone. I'm going to, you know, whatever. One good choice often leads to another good choice and to another good choice and to another good choice. So if you've been stuck in the snowball of bad, just remember one good choice can lead to a snowball of good. I really hope this has been encouraging to you. And I really hope you understand how much God loves you. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things.